for shade analysis and you just want to do shade analysis you know what if you're you're using a, a popular architecture software called sketchup so you know many firms out there uh, have a sketchup license but they don't have a commercial design software license if you're already paying for sketchup pro um, if you're already paying for you know, a, a 3D SketchUp model for your building, then why not just do your shade analysis right there in SketchUp? But this is what I think is interesting about this uh, plugin called Skellion. And they, they don't spend enough time, you know, on this, but you can kind of see how um, they are calculating the the impact of that chimney uh, around the solar modules access to sun so these unshaded modules are all showing a hundred percent and then right by that chimney that one module is showing 96 percent um, and and so they they have a, a nice process for just kind of laying solar panels onto a rooftop and then and then evaluating the shade uh, because of it. Do you need anything further than that to do your energy performance estimate? The answer is probably not for residential. Uh, you know, that's probably good enough. Um, and, and then, you know, if you're, if you're doing projects in SketchUp, you know, being able to just quickly throw on a, a solar array to show your clients to say, oh, look, you know, how about, you know, have you ever thought about this, uh, is pretty interesting. I mean, to, to some extent, this is that 3D image that uh, Aurora Solar works so hard to get you to build on your own. Um, you know, an uh, architecture firm may already have a 3D image that they, you know, they want to add to. You know, in rural areas, get a lot of farmers thinking, well, you know, how much solar can I fit in this field? Um, you know, of all places, SketchUp with Skellion is a good, you know, size uh, sizing uh, software. And so, you know, just like we've seen with Helioscope, just like we've seen with Aurora, uh, you know, it starts out with this overhead image. Um, you know, they're using kind of SketchUp tools to, you know, draw out the house. And, you know, maybe SketchUp knows a thing or two about, you know, <laughs> rapidly developing 3D models. But understand that, you know, just this, this little plug-in, you know, it, it has some features to it that uh, competitors that are 10 times the cost uh, have that, which is the ability to do you know, 3D image based shade analysis. Well, they've generated a shade analysis of those chimney stacks and, and vents. So now there's some roof data. You know, putting in their solar panels. Looks like you can add your own components. Putting in the roof pitch, the row alignment. And, you know, that's simple enough. So here, you know, the, the, the problem with some of these design softwares is you want to know, like, well, how granular are they calculating? Are they just, you know, are they really analyzing the shade on each panel or, you know, on the roof? Uh, Skellion is, is actually a, a module level shade analysis. So all they're, all they're showing right now is that um, that they, they modeled, you know, they, they colored those sections of the arrays a little bit earlier in this video, and now they're showing you the production of those colored sections. So you can actually differentiate between, like, the west surface and the east surface and the north surface and get production values for those different surfaces, which is something you can't do in PDWatts by itself without 
you know, manually uh, doing the model four different times. And so uh, that's kind of neat that they're they're set up to uh, intercept PV watts that way. And I guess the other the other big guys are too. You know, I'm just impressed with Skellion from the fact that it it does, you know, as we've said before, shade analysis, um, but kind of on the cheap. Uh, the caveat is you have to already have a SketchUp Pro license. And so here, what they're what they're showing is, you know, the the PV Watts interface. They have this standard system loss number of fourteen percent, and shading is only three percent of that. And so what what Skellion is doing is calculating the shade percentage on the array and then sending that to PV Watts, and so it will adjust that shade percentage number accordingly. Let's watch another one. This is a, a software that I, I only recently evaluated. It just, when I originally wrote this program a few years ago, um, I guess I just, you know, it didn't make the list. And um, I, I went through their orientation process just the other day, and it, it was very impressive. I think, uh, you know, it might be my new favorite. So here's this is a software it's called PV complete it's made of two components the first component is kind of like helioscope you know basic array layout um, a little bit more of a CAD environment but the downside of PV complete is they do not have lidar data like uh, you know, like uh, Helioscope or Aurora do. You know, so you, the only way to give things height in this program is to actually program it in. If you do plan on generating project permit documents in house, uh, PV Complete is pretty amazing. It's a plugin for AutoCAD, but if you don't have an AutoCAD license, the cost of the plugin and the cost of their software is the same, and the software is AutoCAD in an AutoCAD environment. So, you know, it just wouldn't have AutoCAD with all the you know expansions that you could buy for it that a firm might already have. So you can you can start in an AutoCAD environment, but it's going to be better if you use their sketch tool and then export it to CAD. But, you know, in terms of when I say it's a, a true CAD environment, I mean, they have different layers for everything. So they'll have a, a layer for their wiring diagram and then uh, another layer that is actually the wires between the panels for uh, planning your wire runs and calculating your wire distances. Um, you know, why don't we fast forward a little bit? You know, I've, I've, you know what they're showing here is that, you know, they, they. Th they feel like the way they portray different versions of jobs, you know, one where you use manufacturer A, one where you use manufacturer B. Um, you know, here they're they're stringing the array, kind of. They go for a snakes in a basket approach for this. They have an auto stringing option. It's all exportable to CAD, and so they're counting the panels, they're counting the modules. Uh, they have some plugins with racking companies to count the racking balance of system material as well. Um, you know, conductor footings and links of conductors uh, are now, you know, not being user inputted, but generated from the, the line diagram itself and then exported in a way that is kind of procurement friendly. You know, so now they're going into their single line diagram tool. It's real easy to, if the line diagram generated something that uh, was there originally but needs to be changed, like a uh, solar production meter that was added in later, 
uh, or otherwise needs to be removed. Um, you know, they, they, I'm not sure if they're going to show it in this video or not, but, um, yeah, there we go. Just need to be a little patient. So they're going to take this production meter and say, that's not the production meter how I wanted it with an external disconnect switch. You know, we don't want a meter there or we want a meter only or fuse disconnect switch or no disconnect switch or no meter, you know, and it, it you know, now that conduit there, it has, you know, the ability to have the disconnect switch inserted into it. And then we got a fused disconnect switch. Um, top feed panel versus a bottom feed panel. Um, you know, so, I, so I asked them, I was like, wow, so are y'all modeling the actual panels? They're just modeling, you know, they know what a bottom feed panel and a top feed panel should look like. And, you know, so you can go in and put in your own model numbers, but, uh, you know, they have a drawing there ready for you. And if they don't, you, it's a CAD environment. You have AutoCAD, you can use it. Uh, within that that context you can make your own templates and save them for later use in that CAD environment if you know if you have a particular balance of system material item that you like but no one else does uh, no one, that they don't have modeled and so we're just it's just showing the extent you know they're doing voltage drop calculations they're doing that national electric code detail that solar design tool does what's neat about um, you know what's neat about pv completes is you can go and find the calculation that is most important to you and and go stick it wherever you want in your one line diagram so that it's it's right there so if you know that your inspector is looking for you know uh, terminal temperature calculations or rooftop temperature calculations you know you can find it and put it right into the single line diagram in a, a pretty easy manner and that's that's the benefit of doing it in a, a CAD environment so you know the the final kind of documentation you know includes circuit diagrams that tell you where the circuit starts and where the circuit stops you know one line diagrams that are um, you know what is actually being built and installed on site and not just what uh, the guy modeling it guessed based off your inputted survey um, and then, you know, uh, the electrical calculations are gingerbread that you get to determine and choose and not, you know, what the, the one line diagram as a service company, uh, has chosen. So, um, you know, I, I was, I was very impressed with this one. Um, you know, we didn't we didn't watch. We skipped this video. I'm gonna skip to the very end, just in the interest of time. I want to get into another in depth look at another software. Um, but here's another thing from Skellion that I was was very impressed with. Um, And so what it is, 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 you know, here they're importing the local terrain into SketchUp, which is something that, you know, okay, that's a SketchUp feature and that's cool. And so now they're incorporating the, the slope of that mountain into their solar production estimate. So that's pretty cool, you know, even far away mountains. Racking design. 
For any given roof surface, there is almost always a racking attachment made specifically for that kind of roof. The standard way to attach to a shingle roof is to use a flashed L-foot mounting bracket with a lag screw standoff that is integrated into the flashing which slides underneath the shingle. It is not a perfect process. In new construction, it is much better to plan the project and mount the flashed attachments as the roof is being shingled rather than after the fact. Otherwise, you have to get up underneath the shingle with a pry bar and pry out roofing nails during installation. There are above the shingle mounting systems as well as tile replacements, clips for standing seam metal roofs or corrugated metal roofs, or even sealed standoffs designed for penetrating through metal roofs. Some racking has better integrated cable management than others, but the whole system is pretty much the same. A rail is attached to the L-foot and then solar panels are clamped down to the rail. Mid clips that space and clamp down the solar panel onto the rail between two panels and end clips that go on the very end secure the module frame down onto the rail. Additional components help with the grounding and splicing of the rail together. Pro installers will stagger the L-foot attachments to hit every rafter going across a roof. With consideration to the maximum rail span between attachments, as well as the wind and load considerations that might require the system to use less than the maximum span of the rail between attachments. Like inverter sizing software, racking manufacturers provide online design tools to assist in the racking design and bill of material development. And sometimes these softwares provide structural load evaluation uh, data. In this design software example, the array layout is modeled and some building details are inputted. In another example, the number of rows and columns of individual array sections are inputted into the sizing software separately. The racking design software will ask about the environmental conditions. What's the local wind speed? What's the local snow load? What's the exposure category? Are there objects around that are going to break up the wind? These questions will determine the spacing between roof attachments as well as the gauge of the rail. At the end, with the array layout and building information inputted, the result is a racking material list ready for procurement. In this example, three different kinds of solar rail are recommended with various strengths. For these three rails, the maximum spans are given for different roofing zones. Zone 3 is on the corner of the roof with the greatest wind speed and the least amount of span. The interior of the roof is Zone 1 and the roof cap and eaves are Zone 2. Is the longest span between attachments the most desirable? The longer the span, the fewer attachments are needed to be installed. It's logical to think that the fewer penetrations made in the roof, the better. But the fewer the penetrations made, the greater the wind force and loading force on that roofing attachment. So it's important to evenly distribute the load over a roof truss, meaning there's a minimum number of penetrations needed to hit each rafter as the array moves across the roof. So a solar array might not get much use out of the thickest rail gauge, which could allow for the longest span between attachments. A strong and cost-effective method may be to go with a cheaper rail gauge and conservative attachment spacing. Moving along in the software, the array layout, location, and attachment spacings are inputted into the design software. The numbers are crunched 
to provide the downward uplift and tangential forces on each attachment. In this example, there is a down force of 170 pounds and an uplift force of 100 pounds. The corners of the roof have forces three times that amount. You know, this reinforces what we already know, which is that the corners of the roof and the corners of the solar array, for that matter, will experience stronger wind load than the interior section of the array. Moving the solar array in a few feet from the exterior perimeter of the roof will reduce the load on the solar array, but even so, the corners of the solar array will experience greater wind load than the interior of the solar array. Finally, the rail is selected and the racking material list is produced. The report provides how many sticks of rail are needed, as well as the associated clamping hardware, such as mid clamps, flashing, lag screws, rail-to-rail -rail splices, grounding straps, and other odds and ends. Combined with our inverter list and the solar panels themselves, the specialty material list is ready to order from the distributor. In fact, taking the time to develop an array layout and material list based on the equipment a distributor carries can open many doors. By signing up for an online distributor's email list, the, in, the installer level pricing and product availability can be determined. The solar supply chain is very open. Even non-installers, if presenting themselves professionally, can access installer level pricing from many online distributors. Aesthetic considerations. I tend to work in lower priced energy markets and find myself having to strike a balance between price and cost effectiveness. I don't care much about solar panel efficiency or even which of the brand name manufacturers I use. I'm comfortable with generic solar panels and honestly, I'm more picky about inverter quality or racking type. I like the kind with integrated cable management. Um, but the one solar panel upgrade that I always recommend to residential customers is to get an all black solar panel, which have a black frame instead of a silver frame and a black plastic back sheet instead of a white back sheet. You know, lower end all black solar panels exist. Uh, they will still have grid lines on the front of the solar panel, although those lines fade with distance. You know, top shelf all black panels can look like a rectangular piece of pitch black glass, but they cost a pretty penny too. So I tend to go more for mid-range all black solar panels on residential rooftops to produce a good aesthetic because as they say in fashion black never goes out of style so in my design aesthetic i am going for all black solar modules internal conduit runs and symmetrical array layouts that fill up most of the roof surface where there is budget and the design allows the only error that this solar installer made in this picture is that there's a plumbing vent kind of hidden right here in the middle of the array. The design obviously called for a continuous row of solar panels, but the designer missed this painted black roof vent that is sticking up out of the roof. So by the time the installer gets there, <laughs> They're simply stuck with putting a solar panel out at the end of the array instead of where it was supposed to go. You know, maybe the client says, well, you know, it's on the back of my house, so nobody will see it. Uh, but rooftops are visible the further away you get from the roof. In fact, I will commonly ask clients to walk 
across the street from their home and then turn around and snap a photograph if I'm designing based off a remote site uh, analysis simply to reveal additional roof detail that doesn't appear on Google Maps or Bing Maps. It is possible to simply replumb the vent on top of the roof. Roofing vents are required to be a certain height off the roof to assist with gas dissipation. Uh, so installers might want to give the vent stack a little haircut with a bandsaw, uh, which might be electric code compliant, but could violate other parts of building code the electrician doesn't know about. To maintain plumbing vent height, it is a simple matter of rerouting the pipe underneath the array and out the top accomplished with two 90 degree bends of plumbing pipe. I'm very interested in how to take a rooftop and build the roof out of solar panels rather than to use uh, solar shingles. Uh, solar shingles are not readily available and the ones that do exist are not widely considered cost effective despite the marketing hype. My opinion is that the solar shingles that are on the market don't look any better than having all black solar panels on the roof with an array layout that prioritizes aesthetics. To achieve a hover-like effect with the solar array, with all the cable and racking tucked underneath the array rather than sticking out the edges, the racking cantilever span from the racking design software is important. The very last alpha detachment on the roof is placed within the array perimeter, as well as within the cantilever span of the rail, such that the last bit of solar rail will be cantilevered over the L foot. The last solar panel on the array lands on the rail, and then the array may be cut to length with a cordless bandsaw. This effectively hides the racking underneath the array perimeter. With experience, the rail can be pre-cut down on the ground. Most racking manufacturers have a plastic cap to cover the nub of the cut rail to hide any rough edges. Some top shelf racking systems will go a step further, hiding the end clips of the solar array underneath the module frame, although it complicates the install to in achieve this very high-end look. The other part to making the roof array aesthetically pleasing, which is important for resale value, is to use internal conduit runs through the attic. Internal cable runs are no more complicated than external cable runs across the roof. Uh, internal cable runs make the solar array look better on the roof and it keeps the conduit and cable off of the hot exterior of the roof. The less wire for birds and squirrels to chew on, the better. And there are accessories on the roof for critter management called solar array skirts. But basically, keeping all of your cable and racking underneath the solar array allows it to achieve a very pleasant and almost magic hovering effect up on the rooftop. Here is the end result using internal cable runs to avoid having conduit on the outside of the roof. 20 years from now, these modules will not appear obsolete so long as they are still generating electricity. Planning the conduit run. In the Northern Hemisphere, it is common for solar to be on the south side of the roof, but exterior electronics such as the outdoor solar inverter should be kept out of direct exposure to the sun and so are commonly mounted on the north, east, or west side of the building, typically along the existing electric meter. My preferred method to achieve an internal cable run involves a high material, but because it takes a direct route through the attic, it 
turns out to be no more expensive than routing less expensive conduit alongside the exterior of the building, taking a longer path to the point of interconnection. You know, attics are uncomfortable to work in, but so is a hot roof. You know, speed is the issue here. The question becomes, how do you actually land the cables coming off of the solar array in order to make that transition into and through the attic? High quality solar installers are comfortable drilling holes through the roof. The transition is made at the last solar panel in an accessible corner of the array, one that can be identified later via visual inspection. But code allows the transition box to be tucked underneath the solar panel to protect it from weather as well as improve the aesthetic look of the installation. This is a specialized solar rooftop transition box called Solideck, which is small enough for the job. It has integrated flashing to get up underneath the shingles. The cables come out from the attic to both land on this terminal block, meeting up with the solar cables from the roof, which enter through a cable gland. Of course, this is a specialized box, which costs about $100 just for the empty shell. There are inexpensive code compliant ways to make the transition into the roof in a workmanlike fashion. Um, for example, you could get a flashed pipe boot which can be found at the local hardware store, electrical conduit could then be stubbed up through the pipe boot for the cable to transition between the roof to the attic. One caveat on trying to make the rooftop transition work elegantly with generic off-the-shelf components is that there is only about four inches of clearance between the roof deck and the very top of the solar panels themselves. Often junction boxes found locally are six inches deep. So if the goal is to hide the transition box underneath the array, by the time one considers the height of the pipe boot and the height of the box, it is easy to be in conflict with the array itself. When using generic off-the-shelf components, I will commonly skip the box on the roof simply by transitioning the cables through the conduit via a cable gland and then landing in a box in the attic, accessible and just underneath the solar array. In short, you can achieve a quality installation with off-the-shelf generic parts, but this too requires knowledge and planning rather than last-minute scrambling. DC conductors, when inside the building, are required by code to be protected by metal conduit. It's confusing as metal conduit is associated with a ground path, but in this case, the metal is not for grounding, but instead for physical protection of the cables inside. A rodent is less likely to chew up a wire if contained in metal conduit. A nail or a screw is less likely to puncture a power cable if the cable is contained inside metal conduit. Um, some installers will select microinverters specifically to avoid this metal conduit requirement, allowing the home run from the rooftop to the point of interconnection be made in AC rated Romex. You know, running metal conduit as a retrofit through an attic can be a difficult task. I prefer DC optimizer systems with long circuits, and I will spend more money on balance of system material if it improves installation quality or speed. To enclose my interior DC home run cables in metal from the roof to the inverter on the side of the building through the attic, I use a bundled cable product called MC Cable, which stands for Metal Clad Cable. The conductors are already bundled together in a metal wrapping that encloses them fully. You know, this is expensive stuff. One DC circuit of MC Cable uh, will contain two full-sized cables plus an undersized ground, and it costs just under $3 per foot. 
but costs are kept in check with DC optimizer systems allowing fewer circuits than other kinds of inverter systems. You know, my favorite MC cable has four full-sized cables plus an undersized ground at about 350 per foot, which would give me two circuits total with two positives and two negatives plus a ground. It is expensive, but it can be quickly routed through an attic while meeting the DC metal requirements, making the code compliant installation go very quickly. The MC cable can be landed on a Solideck box and then run through and out the soffit on the underside of the roof eave on the north side of the building where the inverter is landed. MC cable is only rated for damp rather than wet conditions which makes sense as the metal wrapping isn't nearly as weather resistant as a complete metal tube such as EMT conduit. Uh, yet the outside of a building is considered a wet condition unless the outdoor area is sheltered such as a covered parking area, an awning, or a porch. Those would be examples of damp rather than wet environments. So the MC cable transition to the inverter can be accomplished in two ways. It's easiest to pull the MC cable throughout the attic and through the soffit and then land on a junction box. I will then strip off the MC cable wrapping and transition the cables into the EMT conduit through the box before landing on the inverter. Alternately, the transition can be made inside the attic if the permit office opposes any MC cable outside the building due to its damp rather than wet environmental rating. For this home run, most installers will size the cable to be number 8 or number 10 AWG. I usually go for number 6 AWG MC cable because the MC cable comes with an undersized ground. The minimum ground wire to ground the solar rail up on the roof is number eight, and so I select a larger number six MC cable to take advantage of the number eight ground wire that will be included in the MC cable bundle. Otherwise, I would have to run an extra ground separately. Uh, the ground will land in the rooftop transition box before landing on a ground lug on the solar rail uh, completing the grounding run from the inverter on the side of the building up to the solar array on the roof. The solar inverter is then tied into the building ground. Therefore, the easiest code compliant way to bring two solar circuits from the rooftop down to the inverter is to use a number 64 plus undersized ground MC cable or a number 62 plus ground where there's only one solar circuit. Uh, the number 64 is a two conductor pair that will be used for the positive and negative ends of the two solar circuits. Uh, in other words, a 6-4 plus ground conductor MC cable will cover two solar circuits and a 6-2 plus ground will only cover one solar circuit. Uh, or sometimes I use the 6-2 plus ground as a in-attic jumper between subarray sections on the roof. In addition to providing the grounding cable. You know, MC cable is expensive but it makes the array look real nice and it installs quickly. Um, right before we finish, there's one more software I want to show you. Come on with us. Where are you? There we go. Which is Solar Graph. And um, Solar Graph says we do shade analysis, we do permit documentations, and and I'm not going to spend too much time on them because they're they're more on the sales side of things. Um, you know, before I bash them, I want to compliment them because uh, users, for what they are, uh, have really good experiences with them from what I've what I've found. Um, 
but there's there's some solar reviews companies out there um energy sage solar literally a company called solar reviews um that generate a lot of leads for solar companies and sell those leads and so solar graph says well we'll help you sell them by putting them into our software and and here they have you know installers are purchasing leads for projects you know right within the software so a marketing company uh, gets the nibble on the lead they sell it to solar graph solar graph sells it to the installer the installer is now getting project leads from within the you know really what you would call a sales software but it does have some design elements to it so the question is <clears throat> Are the design elements good enough to run uh, a solar company off of? And the answer is it, it depends. So here they are in their design software, and it's, you know, they are plugged into a utility rate database. You know, they have near map imagery built into it, which is, you know, their solar graph is on the high end of pricing, but hey, they got, they got the good high res imagery. So maybe they're not building a 3D model like you would in Aurora, but they're they're trying to impress the customer with a real snazzy photo. If I say real snazzy, I'm saying what an installer who looks at fuzzy satellite photos all the time would say is real snazzy. Maybe not something, you know, your impression this photo might not be high definition. And so we see solar graphs array layout tool is a little bit more rink a dink you know we're just saying okay we're gonna do it in this area you know we're still doing offsets it's kind of like a solar design tool that we saw at the bit the beginning it's just um you know kind of a, a clunkier array layout and so the the next thing is solar graph says we do shade analysis let's see how are they doing their shade analysis i think i'm not even sure in this this example they're they're doing it so we're gonna you know just very briefly what they're showing here is is they're they're really focused on being a sales tool and helioscope does some of this stuff too um but they're they're trying to be even more of a of a sales tool than than helioscope where you know not only are they generating the lead within the software they're generating the proposal uh, they have integrations with uh, solar finance companies uh, built right into it. So uh, Green Sky and Lone Pal are very popular, widespread solar financing companies. Uh, they're making it so you can buy the permit set right within the software. And the questions are very similar to the questions you would get uh, you know filling out that survey that we saw at the beginning for solar design tool so this is you know they're they're using some salt they might be using PV complete in this survey to to develop the uh, line diagram for you but they're not doing it within the software itself um, but what is what is also interesting about that is you know they they put more services in it so you can buy an engineering stamp uh right within the software as well so that sounds pretty cool and i would be be even more excited about solar graph uh, because they say they do shade analysis and so here's um here's their shade analysis tool where you sketch out the roof it says get your shade analysis do your shading analysis and so now they have this kind of thermal image of of the the sun and what that is is it's it's project sunroof and so google has has kind of done some
you know, some mapping. And if I put in, you know, let's just go with uh, rural Mississippi and say check my roof, I get this mapping too. But when I go and fill out the form, it'll say, you know, we're not actually available in your area yet. And so, you know, I can, I can tell that these are sunny and this image is useful enough to say, Hey guy, you know, you might normally press the bounds of doing, you know, East and West facing arrays, but this West facing array right over here by the tree line, you need to stay away from that one. Cause that's, that's getting shaded. And so it is, it is good for me to kind of look at these images to tell me, you know, absolutely where I should not put a solar array, but it's not in, in most cases, if I wanted to go get any more additional information, you know, I, I, I can't, I have to go and then, then, uh, you know, figure out You know, so so I guess what I'm trying to say is that the Google Project Sunroof data is not available in all places, and so the the Solar Graph software is not going to be available in all places, and uh, you know they're they're still not. You know, even if even if your rooftop has the the irradiation image built into it you know they're they're they would be this is for being used more as a, a guide than anything else so i've i've heard anecdotally from installers that the solar graph energy performance estimates are uh not particularly accurate and i i would believe it um because it kind of just looks like uh they're they're just telling you where to put you know, uh, you know basically they're just using this graph to say hey don't get too close to that dormer and put solar on a on a good roof surface it's not uh, providing you with a, a true 3d model that's giving you uh, module level shading duration around chimneys or or trees or things like that uh, to something very general. Okay, very last, I'd like to end with a little trick I use in in uh, Google Earth. You, know, you can, you know, Google Earth has a, a ruler tool in it. You know, click on a portion of the map, click on another portion of the map, and you get the distance between two objects. You also get the the bearing of the line you're drawing with that ruler tool. And so here, you know, our our bearing is 160 degrees. Um, you know, another thing on Google Earth is it gives you the the date that the photo was taken. And so if I know the bearing of the shadow and the date, I can use what's called a sun angle 
azimuth chart, and you can find these online. The U.S. Navy office makes a really good one to put in the location where the photo was taken. So here we are putting in the date the photo was taken, and the bearing of the photo is 160 degrees, you know, at on November 24th. So November 24th. In my location, when the sun is at 160 degrees, that photo was taken at 1030 when the sun is 27 degrees up in the sky. Well, if I know the sun's 27 degrees up in the sky, and I know the length of the shadow, I can use trigonometry to get the height of the tree. And so, you know, if you're if you're doing just kind of a, a spitball shade analysis, uh, it, you're going to be giving yourself plenty of clearance, uh, hopefully. Uh, but you can, you know, use Google Earth to get some uh, some estimates of trees if you have a flat area, and Google's ruler tool, you can determine the height of nearby trees. When you're doing that, don't forget to also <laughs> compare the height of the tree against the height of the tr house because rooftops are a good, you know, 12 feet or more up off of the ground. And so the, the point is, you know, do you need solar design software? Well, you know, remote analysis is possible. Um, you know, many questions can be solved by the client just walking around their home, taking pictures and uh, texting it to you. You know, manufacturers provide racking tools and inverter string sizing tools that ask many of the same questions. Um, and, and in some cases, the manufacturing specific tools provide even more data such as the racking software providing, you know, uplift forces and downward forces um, on their racking components. That kind of information usually doesn't show up in the commercial design software. Um, but there are areas where the, the um, as we've talked about in class today, where the 3D, where the computer design software exceeds um, you know, gets you ready for project permitting. And I've, I've yet to find a good 3D shade modeling tool uh, that's quick and easy to use uh, that is not a paid software. I have yet to find a one-line diagram creation tool that's quick and easy to use that's not a paid software. I have um, yet to, you know, I... You know, I do my own economic analysis and my own spreadsheets, but when it comes time to uh, really, you know, pin the tail on a project, you know, model, I moved to commercial design software to improve accuracy um, it, when, when approaching the final proposal or the final phase of preliminary design. Um, lastly, this is a, a company called Solar Roof Check. You know, they're an engineering stamp as a service. Uh, and I just decided to put in kind of a, their survey form so that you could put it into your site evaluations. You know, noting the, the you know, the, the truss of the attic, the kind of attic space is the most important part. Uh, and then going in and getting the attic spans between rafters and the rafter material. You know, so in conclusion, um, calculating the performance of the solar array for every 15 minute period for every day and then Putting on top of that a variable rate electric rate structure uh, that that changes by the day of the week, you know, trying to calculate that all by hand, you're going to make a mistake. Um, trying to do all the electrical code calculations by hand, you're going to make a mistake. You know, the the solar design software has advanced to the point where it is more accurate than what a human can do on their own.
there's a wide variety of tools out there. It's really just a, a question of budget. And you know, while software fees that range from you know a hundred, you know, solar design tool is fifty, but a lot of these guys start at a hundred and some go up to three hundred a month. You know, that sounds pretty expensive from a monthly subscription fee. On the other hand, how much is a 3D shade analysis on a you know $20,000 solar project worth? You know, it, it can be catastrophic if you skip over it in some cases. In other cases where you don't have any trees around, you might not need the shade analysis, but you may only need a, a one line diagram uh, for project permitting. So, you know, depending on what you need for where, what, how your company functions in the industry might determine your best software purchasing package. Um, and across the board, there's very little out there to help a designer with batteries other than economic analysis. Um, on, on a brighter note, substantial amount of this project documentation can be conducted off-site. You know, I'd say PV Complete would be my best of show. And mainly because as a solar design engineer, you know, I have a passion for detailed construction drawings. I don't think that there's enough in the industry and you know pv complete has the can generate the most detailed drawings in house um, although it definitely has a big con in that without lidar data its shade analysis functions will be limited and so if you go with pv complete uh, you may also need to go with another software for shade analysis or you get pretty ballsy and say, I don't need to do shade analysis. Uh, we're going to talk about that in a minute. On the topic of shade analysis, Helioscope does it quick and easy to the point. And there's a reason they're, you know, the, the popular tool. And, and for that matter, their competitor, Aurora, uh, gets high marks for having a very robust 3D modeling system. If your goal is to have a uh, accurate shade analyzer, uh, you know, Aurora is the most feature rich uh, software out there. Uh, they're also a little on the high end of the price range. And so you do, uh, you know, that, that saying goes, you get what you pay for. You know, with that higher price point, Aurora is uh, trying to be the most feature rich in terms of doing some economic analysis that Energy Toolbase does. You know, doing some, you know, one line diagramming, uh, but not as much as PV Complete or even Solar Design Tool. Um, so, you know, it, it really stands out for kind of having the best shade modeling and 3D. Um, all in one um, it's a very good choice uh, the the only con that I, I really have against Aurora is that uh, you still need another software for generating permit documentation because they're you know they're not trying to be your electrician uh, they're trying to be your design software and so you know they're not uh, you know they don't have the same uh, vision as PV complete does on what their role is on your generating your project documents. Uh, energy tool base I found to be you know almost essential for commercial modeling uh, because it can hone in on commercial facility economics so well uh, when you get on to demand charge uh, electric rates. Uh, it's it's pretty incredible what you can do with a battery and a solar array on on demand charges nowadays and it's going to be what gets you there um pylon 
is a popular uh, software in Australia. I'm not sure if they'll be able to make it over to the United States or not. I know they want to, but it's already kind of a crowded market. The reason why Pylon is popular in Australia is because Near Maps is a pretty expensive uh, high resolution imagery software company and Pylon has more affordable high resolution images. So uh, yeah, I thought I'd point that out. Pylon also has some interesting marketing where they, they try and incorporate kind of features you get with Salesforce or um, HubSpot where it lets you kind of spy on your customer in the sense that you know when they're looking at the proposal and signing proposals, you know, you, you, you know, with all these online forms, you can kind of behind the scenes already know what your customer is spending time on.